So our next speaker is um, Thierry Troosters from the Katholieke Universiteit Leuven, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the proactive uh, project in COPD. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Chairman. So thank you to give us the opportunity to give you a, a quick glance through the proactive uh, project, which is indeed a project that focuses on patients with COPD. So we're moving gears a bit from uh, diabetes towards uh, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and there'll be another respiratory disease asthma uh, later on. And I think we very nicely illustrate how these consortia work. Our consortium proactive is actually led by an FPM member. It's uh, Chiesi Pharmaceutici and Dr. Katrina Brundici, uh, yet I'm presenting it. Uh, the uh, UBiopred project is led by an academic member, and yet it's going to be presented by an FPM member. So you see we, ex we exchange, uh, we exchange uh, tasks uh, within the consortium, which basically shows you that we're collaborating pretty well. Um, you can reach me by email or through the website uh, if you want, if you have further questions uh, afterwards. I have to apologize because I have to rush off after this meeting uh, to a doctoral committee where I'm a member at. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is, is a very prevalent disease in our society, and it's not well known that it's a very prevalent disease. But um, if you look at the prevalence in, in our societies in Europe, and this comes from a large um, study that goes beyond Europe, but I just took the sites that, are, uh, that, that contributed to that study in Europe um, uh, here on, on the slide. Um, you can see that the prevalence of this disease is really immense. About 10% of um, the population above 40 years of age suffers from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The majority of those are smokers. And you can debate a little bit on whether uh, all of that is clinically relevant. Uh, gold stage 1 is typically undiagnosed, and that's why I put it here in the bottom. Uh, and these are uh, patients with moderate or severe disease within our population. So it's really... Uh, uh, disease with a huge burden, an increasing burden, because it is more prevalent in the elderly population. So it's very crucial that we have good outcomes and good drugs for these, uh, for these patients. Apart from that, COPD is also a complex disease. Its uh, treatment is based not only on pharmacotherapy, it's also prevention. We have to try to get as many people as possible to quit smoking, although it will put us out of business. Uh, it's really the best way to treat, uh, to treat this disease because it prevents it from occurring. Um, pharmacotherapy is the uh, hallmark of the therapy in most patients, but there are also some non-pharmacological interventions such as pulmonary rehabilitation, lung transplantation, and lung volume reduction surgery. And appropriate management of this group of chronic diseased patients really takes all these three uh, points into account and therefore outcomes also need to be able to deal with these different, uh, uh, with these different interventions. And so uh, I've depicted, well not I, I mean Netter has depicted this uh, classical COPD patient and you can see that uh, there might be a lung disease but this is not really what you see. What you see are the systemic consequences of, these, of this disease. This patient clearly suffers from breathlessness. Uh, if you're a specialist, you will see this through the pursed lips breathing which the patient is applying. But what is most obvious in this patient, uh, and again, this is a typical emphysematous patient, is the cachexia in this patient, the loss of muscle weakness, the loss of muscle mass, the fact that these patients lose exercise capacity and cannot uh, cope with regular daily activities. And that is really what matters to these, uh, uh, to these patients. And we know that, uh, and it's depicted in this graph, uh, and it, it goes as follows. I mean, patients typically suffer for, or are smoking, and then with a genetic constellation and some exacerbations that may blend into it, they will develop the disease, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, abbreviated as COPD. And that will lead to symptoms, and the most obvious symptom is dyspnea. And dyspnea will lead to... Um, the avoidance of physical activity, because if you're active, you will be more dyspneic, so you avoid it. It's a little bit like pain. And that inevitably leads to deconditioning, um, may also lead to type 2 diabetes, by the way, um, leads to skeletal muscle dysfunction and other comorbidities that we typically see in these patients. And then these patients need actually more air to breathe uh, before they, uh, so, sorry, more air to breathe if they do something. And this will give them more symptoms. And this is sort of a vicious circle where these patients are sucked into. And so an appropriate therapy uh, probably also needs to tackle these, uh, um, uh, these systemic consequences. And we see this from happening. This is from several studies uh, pooled together here. 
where you see healthy control subjects uh, over here at the far end of this slide, and then patients with this undiagnosed, typically type 1 uh, uh, COPD, and then moderate, severe, and very severe COPD. And as their lung function goes down, you also see that these patients become less physically active in their daily life, which is really what they perceive as being uh, the most troublesome problem of this uh, uh, disease apart from the symptoms. Now, how do we go about it in terms of uh, monitoring the disease? Well, there are some classical outcomes, outcomes that are good, that are solid, but only tackle one particular aspect. For instance, the forced expiratory volume in one second, FEV1, measures the amount of air that you can exhale in one second, and that's a lung function measurement, uh, or you can use CT scans or perhaps other biomarkers, uh, but this does not reflect what the patient actually perceives as the problem of his disease. He couldn't care less about how much air he can exhale in one second. What matters to him is what he can buy for, from that air, and this is what we measure with patient reported outcomes. Um, there are also some more integrated outcomes, such as exercise capacity, for example, and then patient reported outcomes that actually will tell you how the patient perceives benefits or problems that occur from the disease, and also may be sensitive to picking up the treatment of these diseases. Uh, some, sometimes a very small uh, effect in terms of FEV1, in terms of lung function, will render a big effect in terms of what these patients can do with that newly acquired FEV1 in terms of their daily lives. The problem is that very few, if nothing, if, if no uh, patient-reported outcome tools are available that are accepted by regulatory authorities as being very reflective of what actually matters to patients. So what do we actually need or what does Europe need? Well, we need to know the effect of our interventions not only on physiological outcomes but also on these dimensions that matter more to patients, and this is what we measure with patient reported outcomes. And so the criteria for a good patient reported outcome tool are that they are responsive to treatment, perhaps even more responsive than your classical physiological outcome because they are more integrated outcomes and take more than just the lung function into account when assessing the effect of an intervention. They should be meaningful to clinicians. A doctor should know uh, what this actually means and effect of so much in this patient reported outcome and we take physical activity as a patient reported outcome and that is something that is very dear to our heart. We're all fans of physical activity and sports, either by doing it or watching it. So uh, physical activity means something uh, to most people. It needs to be understandable to patients and we believe that physical activity is something that is, uh, that is understandable to patients. And then perhaps importantly and sometimes ignored when we design our questionnaires, uh, they need to be acceptable to regulatory authorities. And again, very few patient-reported outcomes in COPD and many other chronic diseases are actually accepted by regulatory authorities to support labeling claims. <clears throat> so what will we do about it with Proactive? Well, Proactive will develop a patient-reported outcome tool that captures the impact of COPD and its treatments uh, on physical activity. And so we will be looking at how a treatment, be it pharmacological or other, affects physical activity levels in the dimensions that matter to patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And we'll take three important steps to that. I've been given 20 minutes to cover five years of work uh, uh, in this presentation, so I'll um, stick to the essentials, let's say. The first step is identifying the dimensions when we talk about physical activity that are really crucial to patients. And think about your own physical activity. Probably what is important to you is what can I do on a normal day? Can I do more or can I do less? Uh, how many symptoms do I experience when I'm physically active? That's another dimension, needs to be measured separately. How does it feel on a bad day or a good day, the fluctuation in my physical activity levels? And for instance, the problems that you perceive that are perhaps more psychological by not being able to cope with your physical activities. For example, today I could not take care of my grandchildren and I was supposed to do that and it frustrates me. And there may be other dimensions that come from focus groups, from qualitative research that we are currently uh, doing with patients to identify the dimensions that really matter to patients. And so there are three sources uh, to, to gather these dimensions and the items of our patient reported outcome um, tool that is the information directly from patients and I should have drawn this uh, oval circle a little bit more big because that's in fact the, the most important source than information from the literature and information that comes from experts in the field. And we attracted the European Respiratory Society as a partner in this project to make sure that we had access to Europe's experts in the field. And so we can have access to not only medical doctors, but also nurses, physiotherapists, allied healthcare workers that deal on a daily basis with these patients in the field. <clears throat> 